this webinar. So our last SMA UK community treatment update webinars were on Zol Gensma last November and then RISDA Plan last December. And today we're really excited to have our panel joining us to talk about how all three possible treatment programmes are progressing. So I'm Mia, I have SMA type 3 and I'll be hosting the discussion today. But before we jump into asking and answering all the important questions, I'll just go around the panel and it would be great if you could each give a brief introduction of yourself. So Francesco, could we start with you? Yes, thank you. I am a pediatric neurologist. I work at the UCL, the Toronto Street Institute of Child Health, and um, together with uh, Giovanni Baranello and uh, Maria Cristina Scotto, we run the SMA Rich UK Pediatrics. Thank you. And Fiona? I'm Fiona Marley. I work for NHS England, um, and I'm head of highly specialised commissioning at NHS England. Thank you. And Jenny? Hi, I'm Jenny Sheehan. I'm a clinical specialist, paediatric physiotherapist. So I'm clinical lead for neuromuscular physiotherapy at Evelina London Children's Hospital. Great. And Robert? Hello, I'm, I'm Robert Mooney. I'm a consultant physiotherapist at the John Walton Centre in Newcastle. Um, uh, I do see paediatric and adult patients with SMA and other neuromuscular diseases and with uh, Dr. Chiara Marini, um, we work together in the SMA REACH adult site for, for the whole country, for the whole UK. Thank you. And Chana? Hi, I'm Chana Hewa Madima. I'm an adult neuromuscular neurologist from Sheffield, and I look after adult SMA patients. Great. And Imelda? Hello, I'm Imelda Hughes. I'm a paediatric neurologist in Manchester. And um, we chair the Zolgansma National MDT. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you all for finding the time in your busy schedules to be here. Um, so Fiona, I wonder if we can start with a recap of what the position is in England in terms of which children can potentially access Nusi Nursen and RISDA plan. So, um, both of those products are available under what we call managed access arrangements that um, NICE has evaluated those medicines, but there are still some uncertainties about those medicines. So there are special arrangements for them. Um, but um, both of those products are available to eligible patients. Um, in terms of numbers, there are around about 200 children on Nucinison. That number has come down a little bit recently because some children have been able to access Dolgensma, so they no longer need to be able to access Nusenison. And I'm sure Imelda might have something to say about that later. Um, and there are just under 100 children on Ristoplam, and around about 70 children have accessed Dolgensma as well. Great, thank you. And Francesco, can you tell us if all the children waiting for access to Nusi Nursen have been assessed and give us an overview of the treatment programme and how it's progressing. And I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, child in the entire country who would like to access or the family would like to access Nusi Nursen who has not been able to access it. I think that both at our centre, but you know, to the best of my knowledge also nationally, this is um, you know, the, the pathway for accessing this has been established quite a while ago. And uh, uh, like probably of the various drugs is the one that uh, can, you know, the hospital have it on stock. And uh, if you have a, uh, somebody diagnosed today, uh, you today is Tuesday, probably tomorrow or on Thursday, you can do it. Um, and uh, so from that perspective, I think that is, uh, um, I'm not aware of any, uh, any um, gap in service provision. I think that the, uh, we are monitoring uh, the, how things are, or how uh, individuals pre prefer to um, pre treatment preference and pre treatment choices. Um, I think that as already mentioned, some uh, individuals who were, were originally receiving medicine have now gone to receive George Jasmine. Um, 
the numbers are still relatively small, but, um, and, and RISD-PLUM, the next question will be probably for RISD-PLUM, but of course, the RISD-PLUM has only been available for the, you know, only very recently. So I think we will probably need to um, wait longer to see the full picture. Uh, but I, I would be fair to say that at least in our clinic, the majority of the people who were on SNS and have decided to stay on SNS, but not all, some uh, individuals will not change. Mm, okay. And so in terms of giving a recap for RISD-PLAM, you're suggesting that we need to wait to see more what happened? I think that he, he, at a national level, I, I think that would be better because in a way, as you as you realize things are moving every week, that whatever figure I give you next week will be wrong, uh, just because of the timing. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and Jenny, I understand that a lot of the monitoring of progress of children is undertaken by physios. How is that going? Yes, yes, that's going well. So we have a number of standardized assessments that are used amongst all the centers. So um, uh, we're using the same ones with all the treatments. So we have the CHOP Intend assessment, which is designed for children up to the age of about two. So we start with that one with the babies. And then what I tend to do is do two assessments when I do the CHOP Intend and the revised Hammersmith. And then we move on to the revised Hammersmith for the older children, all types. Uh, and then as they're a bit older, we introduce the ROLM, which is the upper limb assessment. Um, that's mainly for sitters who can't achieve as much on the revised Hammersmith. And we also introduce the EK2, which is more, it's a mixture of um, subjective quality of life um, and function. So we move gradually through the assessment. So it's quite a long process and we can, you know, it can take up to two hours really if you've got quite a lot to do. Um, but on top of that, we're also doing our, our day job, if you like, which is managing the children, looking at their contractures and their strength and their spine and advising on what to do from that point of view. No, I understand. And uh, Imelda, the other treatment is the gene therapy Zolgensma, which has now been available for almost a year. I understand that it is overseen by the national multidisciplinary team. Can you tell us about how that program is progressing? Yeah. Um, so to date, uh, from the program started, we've had 96 referrals to the National MDT referrals or um, informing of, uh, of treatments because children less than seven months don't actually need to be referred. We just need to be informed. Um, of those two were from Northern Ireland, one from Wales, the rest are from England and 67 treatments have been given. Um, in the past 12 months, there've been, nine, uh, there've been 19 um, new incident cases under seven months of age. Uh, there are an additional two um, who both had symptomatic COVID infection and so have had other treatments, though they may be referred later. And there were 13 uh, between the ages of seven and 13 months. So we're still seeing quite late diagnoses. Um, there were four children over 13 months referred, but two of these had SMA type 2 and so were not eligible. Um, we've had um, quite a number of referrals of children who've been previously treated um, of various ages. And at the minute, we're assessing children who are up to the weight, up to the weight of 18 kilos. In the older, heavier group, um, we're doing a um, an assessment where they come to an infusion centre or scene and then that um, is discussed at the National MDT and a decision made. And um, of, let's say, the 10 children between 15 and 18 kilos who've been referred so far, um, four have been considered eligible, one has been treated, um, three uh, other parents are still deciding whether they'll go ahead with this treatment because it's much more difficult 
to understand where the balance of risks and benefits lie for these children. Um, and some parents have decided not to go ahead with the referral or not to go ahead with treatment. Um, we've had um, two pre-symptomatic children referred. Uh, one has received treatment. Unfortunately, the other had um, neonatal jaundice and so treatment has been um, delayed uh, while they, they received another treatment just until, um, until that, that cleared and they will be treated in due course. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Fiona, we've talked about England and access for children. Are you able to tell us if access is similar in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales? So unfortunately, I don't have a completely comprehensive picture and I will make sure that I get that to um, Liz and Jackie so that that can go onto the SMA website. Um, so um, in terms of Zolgensma treatment, as Imelda has indicated, um, Welsh patients are able to access that in England. Uh, Scottish patients are able to access that in Glasgow. Um, and I think patients from Northern Ireland, some are coming to England, but it should be widely available. And Lucinison is now available in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Aberdeen. So uh, once I've got that complete picture, I, I will definitely let you know, Mia, and I'll let Liz and Jackie know. Thank you very much. Um, so now turning to treatment for adults, we've got the two possibilities, which are Nucinersen and Rizdaplan. So Fiona, again, can you give us an idea of the numbers of adults on each treatment? Yep. So um, the latest numbers I have um, are that there are 75 adults on Nucinersen and 124 on Rizdaplan. Great. And Chana, can you tell us what the picture is across the country in terms of the rollout of the two programmes? Uh, thanks, Mia. Um, compared to the paediatric services, uh, adult services had to uh, um, take a step back and, and reorganise some of their services to, uh, to rethink how we provide the care for SMA patients. Because prior to these two treatments being announced, the standard of care for adult SMA patients, I would say at best was mediocre. And, and we met the patients once a year or so, and some of the patients perhaps got fed up and, and, and left the services in some centers. So once, uh, uh, this first, for example, the Nusi Nursing was first announced in July 2019 uh, by NICE, so then uh, adult centers had to do something called the gap analysis to look at uh, uh, what are our strengths and weaknesses in order to provide these services. And some centers also had to apply to the Drugs and Therapeutics Committee to get permission to offer this treatment in their hospitals. Different hospitals have different uh, thresholds of tolerance of risk of this kind of a new treatment. So some centers had to fight this battle a bit longer than the others. And, and um and, and some organizations were allowed to reorganize their existing services to provide the, uh, this new demand and the other centers were asked to put new business plans, et cetera. So this meant of the 11 centers that were announced, some centers were able to start sooner, the others had to take time. And in, in, my, in my understanding, almost all centers have now started treatment. If not one center, I think is imminently going to start. Perhaps Fiona probably could uh, yeah. shed some light on this. Um, so, uh, then, then uh, at, at the beginning, uh, most centers had to prioritize how they treat uh, because the nursing was initially approved uh, in, in terms of adult patients for the type two and uh, type three walkers. Um, and, and we knew that type two SMA patients had very complicated spines, whereas the type three ambulant patients were fairly um, easy to access pass. We need to preserve their walking. So most centers had to prioritize these patients first in order to get on with the treatment. For example, in, in Sheffield, um, we had uh, uh, 32 SMA type two patients. And when we assessed their spines, all 32 were not uh, uh, accessible via regular lumbar puncture or even through interventional radiology. So se different centers had a uh, um, a uh, bit more uh, differences in technology. So some centers started uh, using interventional radiology to treat some other type two SMA patients, um, whilst most centers got on with type three. 
But then um, uh, um, we, we were lucky that um, uh, NICE changed uh, the criteria, removed the criteria uh, for lucidness and for adult patients, and then non-ambulant type 3 patients could also access. Um, now, this kind of added a little bit more patient load to most of us, uh, and, and um, the type 3 non-ambulant SMA patients were, uh, were not as straightforward as the ambulant uh, patients. Uh, there were some challenges with their uh, the health problems as well as the spinal anatomy, et cetera. So we had to look into innovative ways of how we could deliver this treatment. So some centers started using ultrasound scan, for example, in Sheffield and others had more involvement with the interventional radiologists. So th that meant uh, so the centers who had more uh, services that they could draw on, they were able to make much uh, steady progress. Um, and we are all in touch through Adult SMA uh, Reach Network. Uh, we meet uh, and, and uh, share ideas. So um, if there was best practice in one center, then they, we shared it with other centers so that they could get up to speed. Um, whilst we were um, uh, uh, um, just about uh, uh, managing all new and and patients, then the risk plan was approved as uh, extended access or, or the early access to medicine scheme. And, and uh, that meant that uh, initially the type one and type two SMA patients who could not access other treatments uh, could now access the risk plan, which meant the type two SMA patients who were waiting to start a treatment now could access a, a, a therapy. So uh, we had to bring these patients also uh, into the clinic. And um, that means the footfall through the hospital was in suddenly increased. And uh, uh, we must not forget that all these treatments were approved during a time of COVID. And so in 2020 and 2021, most of the adult centers um, either staff were redeployed or they had significant challenges in opening up their clinics to bring patients in, particularly vulnerable patients like SMA type, uh, SMA patients. So th this hampered uh, our rollout of, of the two treatments. Uh, now that we are getting used to the COVID, working, living with COVID and centers uh, having uh, managed their, uh, shall we say, uh, the, the bureaucratic red tapes and, and, and uh, the need for organization of staff, and, um, and, and also uh, uh, learning from each other, we have made significant progress. Um, and, and in terms of risk diplom, um, I think again, of the 15 adult centers, almost all of them are, have started uh, treating uh, and, and offering treatment for SMA patients. Uh, and one center I think is imminently going to start. Um, again, Fiona might be able to give us the latest on that. Yes, that's exactly the position channel. I think we have one centre who hasn't yet treated patients, but is, is due to that do that imminently. So Robert, similarly to the programmes for children, I understand that a lot of the monitoring of pro progress of adults is undertaken by physios. How is that going? Yeah, um, a bit similar what the Jenny was saying, we've got a, a set of assessment but, uh, for, the adult, for the adult group we faced a number of challenges. One is what Chana has already mentioned. There were no, in many centers, there were not proper, you know, multidisciplinary um, clinics set up for, for those centers. So the fact that there's now disease modifying treatments has brought many adults back to these clinics that were only seen by a neurologist, some of them follow up just by the GP, and that had created a, a, an additional challenge for the adult population. So we've been trying to help those centers. There were well-established clinics like the, the one that China is leading and ourselves in Newcastle and, and others, but there were many centers that they, they needed to, as, as, as China said, put together a, a, almost from, from scratch a, a clinic. So physio-wise is a reflection of that. And we're trying to support these, these physios that are moving into potentially SMA world without having much experience and trying to support them through SMA uh, really more um, weaker patients, severely affected patients, adult patients. There was uh, no real outcome measures there to have a, a good handle of the chopping pen that Jenny has mentioned. 
is designed to use in infants and, and little children. So it's not suitable for adults. So we had uh, difficulties to assess this patient. So there's different initiatives and we're trying to work as fast as we can to put together. And there's one new assessment that we, we've created in conjunction and with international groups with the US and, and Italy together with, with us in the UK, that's called the ATEN, which is aiming to be able to is, is doing our best and, and I think we're doing well. We, we, we're managing to give access to patients and trying to put together evidence of, of the effect of the treatments and implementation of the standards of care, which is also a very important aspect of, because we don't just want to provide patients with these very important treatments. We want them to have access to standards of care. And as Chana said, this wasn't the case for the, the especially the adult population across the, the country. So we're working to, to implement that as well. Great, thank you. And again to Fiona, we've talked about England and access for adults. Are you able to tell us if access is similar in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales? So I'm afraid I have a less comprehensive picture here. So um, I'm advised by my colleagues in Scotland that risk plans available in Glasgow and that there are discussions taking place elsewhere. Um, Nucinicin's not yet available in Scotland. And unfortunately, I don't have the picture for Wales and Northern Ireland yet, unless anyone else on, on the group, on the webinar is able to advise. But I would say I will make sure that I get that, that information so we have a comprehensive picture. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about access to treatments, but we, from adult SMA reach, uh, we've got line up uh, Cardiff uh, to have an SIV to be um, established as an SMA reach adult site uh, and the 5th, of, 5th of May probably. So I'll, I'll see what, what that brings, but in terms of access to treatments, I'm not entirely sure, but we will be able to support them in that sense. Just to say that we do um, have a national clinical panel and some of the members of that panel are, are here on the webinar today. Um, and the NICE guidance does say that if individuals are thinking of switching treatment between Lucinus and Ristiplam or vice versa, that they should contact the clinical team for advice. Um, that's in some way partly because we want to make sure that we collect all the relevant information so that when those drugs are really evaluated for routine use, that we've got a real body of evidence, but also because there are some clinical complications when people change to one treatment and then may want to change back again. Um, and also, we're also able to offer advice, obviously in conjunction with the um, national MDT about any individuals who've had gene therapy and then who may want to either um, have treatment with nucinicin or ristiplam or um, restart treatment with one of those, um, one, of, one of those drugs. I mean, we do expect that number to be small because you know, Zolgensma is, is, is intended to be an effective treatment. So that clinical panel is, is there to offer advice um, and we, we meet every fortnight. So you know, we, we, can, you know, we can provide our advice pretty quickly to, to clinicians. Fiona, if someone isn't already under a specialist centre but is interested in treatment, what should they do? So we work closely with Liz and Jackie to try to make sure that there's a comprehensive picture all the time on the website of which centres are offering which treatments. So my, my view would be that in the first instance, someone should contact their nearest centre on that list. Um, there are a few centres who are offering Ristiplam but not Nucinicin, um, but those centres should still be offering you know, a comprehensive assessment for that individual so that if, if nucinicin is the better option for them, that there's re-referral on to a centre who can offer nucinicin. Thank you. And so this is a general question to those working in the clinical field, and I think it's been briefly touched on already today. But talking about treatments, I'm very aware that whatever the treatment, children, young people and adults will still need and must receive care and support. And advice on this is set out in the International Standards of Care, though these were last updated in 2017. So is anything happening about updating the standards of care and what care and support should people expect now? Shall I start from pediatric and then others will, uh, will continue? I, I, perhaps before uh, addressing this, I think uh, one thing that I, I 
theme that comes from all the discussion from my colleagues uh, is the fact that it's probably appropriate. Well, I think, I personally think it's definitely appropriate that there are different choices and uh, that different families, different situation, different clinical condition. Um, in a way, we are in a very privileged position where there are now three drugs, at least uh, for type one SMA and two for the non-type one SMA. Um, and I think you, it is, it's refreshing to hear that in discussion, some families may have a strong feeling that they may still change idea provided that you know, balance information is provided. I think that is a healthy system, I think. Uh, and so um, I thank my colleagues because in a way, you know, the, we are essentially equipoised for many of these treatments and uh, is, is eventually the family that need to take the decision. But evidence uh, is what we can provide. Um, regarding the standard of care, you, uh, I, I think I, I would also say, uh, again, this is not to make publicity for uh, UK or England and so on, but we, are, uh, we have a tight community. Um, you, you, it's not only that you link us now in a webinar, but you know, uh, we are, I see, Channa and, uh, and uh, Melda and Robert more frequently than my wife. Uh, and th unfortunately, this is not a joke. Uh, so, so we work together uh, uh, very well as a, as a, a network of pediatric and adult colleagues. And I think that we have, a, we have uh, uh, an excellent um, you know, collaboration uh, track record uh, from, however, as you probably indicated, and my colleagues have mentioned, um, standard of care is a moving target. I, and I don't think we should be complacent to say we are doing the best that can be done. We, you know, uh, we are doing well, but uh, is a moving target. We should be um, moving uh, this target forward. And that is appropriate. I think that there are perhaps two things I would say. Firstly is one, aspect that we may have underestimated, and I think was briefly touched by Chana, um, but you know, you, you have now three drugs, you now have um, these children, depending on young adults who were not seen as frequently, who now need either to come to the hospital to get you know, frequent lumbar puncture, or they may be seen uh, more frequently in the adult services, and, but the number of hands on deck is the same. I think that that gap, um, from any perspective, from physiotherapy, from medical perspective, I think is, is an important aspect. And of course, this gap is going to increase because the number of people with type 1SMA now uh, dying uh, is changed dramatically. Um, and therefore, uh, I think it is an important aspect that we should all, and this will affect you know, doctors, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, and everybody else. So I think this is a something where we started to do some work with the you know, advocacy group. Um, and, but I think this, I, I'm starting to get, get a bit concerned that this gap will eventually continue to grow. And unless we address it now, will lead to um, uh, it's like um, difficulties in managing expectation. Uh, that, that I think is my concern. I think regarding the other aspect of the standard of care, you mentioned the previous, um, papers have been published now in 2016, 2017, and this is quite a while ago. This is the pre-treatment uh, era. Those treatments were only in clinical trials, so there was no recommendation made on uh, you know, what at the time were experimental therapies, none at all. So at the moment, uh, as we speak, there are two parallel but closely related initiatives, one the European Neuromuscular Center, uh, and one coordinated by the SMA Foundation to re regroup the, uh, the various, you know, what had been groups involved in the past and new people, new groups, to rediscuss where we are in terms of the standard of care. Uh, and this will be followed by, this process has just started. So, you know, the, literally has just started probably last week or two weeks ago. Uh, so um, I think this will take, probably you know the best of 2022 to be finished uh, there will be uh, a european ayahuasca center workshop to discuss this aspect and we hope to have uh, well firstly to disseminate information even ahead of publication but we have some publication to that will inform 
and also will help to address some gap in clinical services, uh, having at least something in writing uh, that helps uh, to then when we come to negotiation with our individual trust to, to explain that the reason why there is more need for respiratory physician, physiotherapy, orthopedics, and uh, speech and language and so on is, is not for any other reason. There are more patients, there are more people, luckily they're surviving and they're doing quite well, but they are not um, cured. Uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, ongoing uh, uh, intervention is still necessary. So, and I know it's more difficult with adults, but I think they, in the community, they're really struggling to maintain the standards of care um, for physiotherapy. They have got a bigger work uh, caseload, as Francesca said, um, and they're not quite sure what they're doing with them and they need guidance. As we're doing pretty well in meeting standards of care, but I think they are struggling with the amount of physiotherapy that the family families are expecting and wanting and the community services are just not able to provide as much as the families are, are probably needing. Just wanted to add in, in the sense of the sta access to standards of care last, last week or the week before we just got our paper accepted for publications about real world data in access of standards of care in the UK. So we've run a survey through the SMA registry. And, and this is exactly what the, the paper reflected, adult patients having very limited access and pediatric patients having insufficient access. So it's not that pediatric patients are doing better, but they're not um, fulfilling the, the standards pockets of, of, well, good access, what it's related to respiratory care, which is reassuring. Um, but, but there's many, many aspects that could do with, with better, better support. If I may add to that, uh, from an adult point of view, Mia, um, these, these are patients that we are beginning to see more frequently, uh, particularly uh, we see them every six months at least, and some patients every four months. And, um, and, and, and when, you, when, you, when you begin to see patients that frequently, you um, begin to notice changes. For example, um, uh, patients who are gaining weight and, and you suddenly think about how that's going to impact on their maintenance of walking and, and, and uh, general posture, etc. And then also um, uh, we, things that we haven't really paid much attention before, like uh, the cholesterol levels and, and uh, the blood sugar management and, and the vitamin D levels and things like very basic level uh, assessments of these patients um, ideally should have been managed in the community by the GP, but these patients are relatively stable. They might not see their GPs otherwise. Um, and we become we are becoming more aware of these uh, kind of things that need to be monitored and, and they can be treated. At the same time, um, unlike the pediatric population in the adults, uh, we uh, did not regularly monitor their spines and, and, and particularly those, who, who, those patients who are, who are, who are walking. Um, and and, and uh, we have become more aware of these problems that the patients have um, and, and as Francesca said, I think this is a moving target. What is the, what is the minimum care standard? Um, because our expectations are now high because these patients have disease modifying treatments and their clinical picture might also be different in, in future what, uh, compared to what we are used to managing. Thank you. Is there anything else to add from anybody else or are we happy? I, 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 a related uh, question, or indirectly related, uh, relate, is the fact that there is no question that whatever treatment, uh, the earlier intervention is uh, the key. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is ongoing work, and I know that uh, you are also involved in uh, now uh, supporting an application for newborn screening for spinal muscular atrophy that, of course, will not address the unmet need of who have SMA today, but moving forward, that will also help quite a lot. So that I think will be uh, quite an important aspect. And uh, I, hopefully um, the, this will 
be approved this round uh, and not been approved in the past, but now there are three approved treatments or well, two available for newborn. Um, and uh, I think that is, is probably the, another area where focus uh, needs to happen so that we, we can start as soon as possible to offer. The, the, you know, we, I, I could also say, I just received an information today that in, in uh, a leading journal, uh, the manuscript on the pre-symptomatic receiving baby gene therapy has just been accepted today. And it, there is no question that that is what, where we would like to be. Um, uh, and, uh, and hopefully in time, that's where we will be. And I would just like to um, completely agree with, um, with Francesco on that. Um, and um, most of the incident cases um, that we've seen or have been referred are really very, very severely affected by the time of diagnosis. And um, some of them have had to have treatments delayed because they are ill, uh, sometimes in intensive care, sometimes needing nutritional and respiratory rehabilitation before we can consider treatment with Zolgensma. So I think um, the ability to diagnose these children before they're severely affected, when they could benefit maximally from this treatment, uh, would be very, very, very welcome. Um, and finally, this question is open to anyone. Um, but just are there any other or further developments that you think the community will be interested in? Uh, for example, I've heard about something called PROMS, but I don't know if we've covered fully. So if anyone could explain about this and whether there are any developments with this. So PROMS is patient reported outcome measures. So there's different ways that we can track disease progression. One is just asking you to do certain tasks that will show us how strong are your muscles and how these change over time. But other ways to assess this is how you use those abilities in your home and how you perceive that your strength and your overall capacities are helping you to manage in your daily life activities. So when you tell us about how you handle all of this, it's what we call patient reported outcome measures. And that help us to understand what you're able to do with what we see in clinic that you're able to to do and this is a very important aspect because with the new treatment and with overall disease progression is is a very important aspect to to make sure that that the treatments that we've seen that had help in in certain aspects of that condition translate in changes in your life and your quality of life so as part of this we there's a focus on trying to assess patient reported outcome measures and for the adult project, uh, adult sma reach platform, we've added some of these uh, um, prompts into um, the set of assessments that we, we're going to be using. And this is going to be done through the patient registry. Again, a shout out for people to register in the SMA registry in the UK and to, for the patients to be able to report um, about how they're managing. And, and for clinicians, there's a future plan for clinicians to have access to that data and be able to judge how, how things are working for, for each of individual patients. I think there are similar initiatives also in the pediatric side. In, you know, the, as you know, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the registry is supported by some of the companies and with one of these companies, uh, there will be an initiative with uh, some problems for pediatrics as well. Um, but I, I think we, we are learning on how to correlate these to um, what we measure in clinics and, and see how much they are parallel uh, and or divergent and um, hopefully converging. Well, thank you. I know you're all very busy people. So thank you again for finding the time to answer our questions today. I know that I found it really insightful and useful. And as someone with SMA myself, I'll admit that I find this whole topic area incredibly exciting and incredibly daunting in equal measure at the same time. So it's been a real pleasure to, to talk it through with all of you. And hopefully everybody listening has felt the same. And again, on behalf of the SMA community, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you and your colleagues for all your hard work and your efforts and your energy 
for so many years that have enabled us to get to this really exciting place. Also, thank you to SMA UK and Liz and Jackie who organised this webinar. But unless anyone has anything else to say, I guess we'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.